Friends, you've heard the scripture beautifully read into your hearing. My young sister Samara is going to come back and read our thesis verse. Turning your Bibles with me, this is very important, to Exodus chapter 29. Samara, if you would come on back and prepare to read our thesis verse. In the 29th chapter of Exodus, 29th chapter of Exodus, and underline verse 45. Here she comes. I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Verse 45 is the key verse in that chapter. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you briefly on the subject of tabernacle thankfulness. Tabernacle thankfulness. You should know when you read the book of Exodus that the priesthood is profoundly important in the history of God's relationship with the children of Israel. The priesthood in this particular book represents a central institution. It is the covenant that is made between God and God's people. The priesthood was established to facilitate worship, to ensure atonement, and to maintain covenantal relationship between God and God's people. Simply stated, the priesthood in Exodus represents as a bridge. It's a bridge between a holy God and ultimately a sinful nation. The reason why the priesthood is so important in the book of Exodus is because as Protestants, you must understand that I am not the only priest in the building. As Protestants, you must understand that those who have been licensed and ordained and are sitting on this first pew are not the only preachers in the building. The New Testament teaches us about the priesthood of all believers. And that is the expectation that every single one of us in here would recognize the priestly nature in your own life. In other words, whether you want to accept it or not, you have a church you've been called to preach to. You've got members of that church, and your members are going to be sitting at your Thanksgiving dinner table on Thursday. And as you have filled your spiritual bank account with us all year long, if you recognize that you are in the priesthood of all believers, if you will receive your divine assignment to be the priest at your own address, the question becomes, what do you have in your own spiritual bank account to pour out on the souls that are going to break bread with you this Thursday? I know, brothers and sisters, because I've been to many of your houses, I know that you are going to have a scrumptious meal. I know that you are going to have food and fun and fellowship and football. I know that you are going to bless the table before you eat. But if the priesthood represents a central institution in the covenant between God and God's people, and if the priesthood was established in Exodus to facilitate worship, to assure atonement, and to maintain covenantal relationship with God, then we, Providence, have more to do this Thursday than just eat turkey. This is God's expectation of us every time members of your church walk into your home or you walk into their home and you sit at a table and you break bread together. Surely I want you to have fun and surely I want you to eat good food and surely I want you to watch football and surely I want you to fellowship. But, but, but this holiday called Thanksgiving has more to do with how God is blessing the people in your church that you have been called to minister to and less to do about some pilgrims who took some land from the natives who lived here when they got here. What if in the Christian church we took seriously the call on our lives to be the priests in the churches that God has placed us in? 
We focus less on turkey and pilgrims and sweet potato pie, and we focused more on coming to the table and breaking bread to honor the sacrifice that God has made in our lives and pouring out what God has deposited in us on the people that God will send to your table. Everybody that you will dine with this Thursday, whether you like them or not, is a member of your church. If they weren't, they would have never made it to your table in the first place. And so since they are there, I want you to have a word for them this Thursday. And if my spiritual bank account is full, then I believe God wants you to give people more than turkey on this coming Thursday. Friends, this is why Exodus chapter 29 is so important for us in the week of Thanksgiving. Because when you think about the Exodus, what tends to happen is people forget that it's a whole book. They skip over the fact that there's so much in the book of Exodus. And the only thing they think about is what happens at the beginning of the book when the children of Israel leave Egyptian bondage and move into the wilderness. We forget that there's a whole book here that describes how a people are growing closer to God and moving up in their spiritual growth and maturation. When I read the story of Exodus, I read a story that is less about a triumphant departure from bondage and more about a God who did life with the children of Israel in the wilderness. I mean, think about that, brothers and sisters. Is not God doing life with you and I in the wilderness that we live in? Sure, one day we will get to our metaphorical Canaan. Sure, one day you and I will make it to our own promised land. But every day between now and the time you make it to your metaphorical Canaan, do you realize that you've been in the wilderness and God has been with you every step of the way? Your whole life that you've been in the exodus from the womb that your mother brought you out of into this limited space called time. Your whole life, God has been leading you and loving you. God's been guiding you and gifting you. God's been starting you and stopping you. And every day that you are on the planet, you are in an exodus. Soon you will depart this limited womb called time and you will be in the promised land in eternity with your Savior. But none of us are rushing to get there. Somebody say amen. So when you read the story of the Exodus, you shouldn't just read the story about a people in something that happened 50,000 years ago. You should be reading your own story because it's written right there in the book. And it's a story that describes how God walks you through the wilderness of this life. And if you would just talk to the people on your pew and behind you, if you would just make a few friends here in the sanctuary today, you would find out that you're not the only one walking through a wilderness. Everybody in here has a story of circumstances and situations, a story of people and problems, a story of triumph, valleys and mountains, and how they are making it through the wilderness that is their life. But more important, it's not just to understand what God will do with you while you're in your wilderness. But Exodus is a book that you should read to understand what God expects of you as you sojourn through the wilderness of your life. Exodus is a very interesting and wonderful book. It it opens with Israel's oppression and it teaches us about Moses' early life. By the time you get to chapter five, there's a transition to confronting Pharaoh and the 10 plagues begin. You remember the plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians to help release the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. By the time you get to chapter 11, the plagues have ended, the Passover has come, and the exodus from Egypt shall begin. It is 19, verse chapters 19 and 24 that describe how they have crossed the Red Sea. They journey to Sinai, and the covenant is given to them at Mount Sinai. The Israelites arrive at Mount Sinai where God establishes God's covenant with them. But the covenant that God establishes with them at Sinai was not exclusive to them because you wouldn't be sitting here today if God hadn't established the same covenant with you. God gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. He gives them additional laws to tell them how they should worship and how they should have justice within their life in community. He gives them instructions for the tabernacle and worship. And then in chapter 28, 
God gives them the priesthood. He gives the priest these sacred garments that they are to wear, and he appoints Aaron and his sons as the initial Levitical priests of the children of Israel. Instructions are given for their consecration and the design of their priestly garments, like this beautiful sweatshirt I have on. These are called my priestly garments. And it symbolizes the sacred role that these priests were to maintain as they were mediators between the people and God. Because every now and then, you have to understand that your role as a priest is to recognize that though God is willing to talk to everybody, everybody is not willing to talk to God. Though God is willing to share with everybody, everybody is not in a position to receive from God. Though God will pour out on everybody, everybody is not open to what God has has to say and every now and then you've got to recognize you are the priest in your family you are the priest in your friend group you are the priest at your thanksgiving table baby that means you're supposed to step in on somebody's behalf and intercede to god because they don't have enough sense to pray for themselves there are some people in your life who couldn't talk to God even if they tried. That's why they talk to you, baby. You are the one who takes the information out of their mouth and takes it straight to God's ears. You don't have enough sense to pray for yourself, but I'm going to pray for you. You don't know how to fast for yourself, so I'm going to fast for you. You don't know how to read your Bible, baby, I'm going to read for you. And I'm going to pray until change comes in your life. There are people in your life who need you to be their priest. And they're going to be sitting there sopping up turkey sauce with a biscuit. You can't get them to come to church no other day, but they'll be there on Thursday. Soon as that turkey hits the table, there they are. Ready to eat. And I want you to feed them, but the Bible teaches us, give them more than just food. This is why you should care about the 29th chapter of Exodus. God has been in the wilderness with the children of God. And just as God has been with you, he was with his people here in the book. And though the priest has been appointed, Aaron and his sons, you're now in the 29th chapter that Samara read to us. You're now given detailed instructions on how the priest have been called to sacredly serve the tabernacle. Uh-oh. Do you know you don't get to just serve the church of your family any way you feel like it? You don't get to serve the people in your church any way that comes up in your mind. But if you read the 29th chapter closely, God gives you specific instructions on how God expects the priest to serve at the tabernacle. Since the tabernacle belongs to God, then I have to serve at the tabernacle the way God instructs me to. I think you missed it. When you go home today, I want you to drive to your address. I want you to get out of your car, through your garage, and I want you to walk through your door. I want you to look around, and I want you to realize, don't none of this stuff belong to me. I want you to finally get it through your head that everything you have attained in this life has come to you compliments of the Lord our God. It was nothing but the goodness of the Lord that gave you that car, that gave you that house, that gave you that door. If you got carpet, praise God. If you got hardwood floors, praise God. If you got linoleum, praise God. God gave it all. And since it's God's house, then it's God's table as well. You thought you invited people to Thanksgiving dinner. Mm -mm. All you did was articulate what God told you to say. That's God's table and this communion meal we're about to have, communion, break it apart, common union. This common union meal we're about to have is functional for God's purpose. And if I let these folks come into God's house and sit at God's table around God's food and I never tell them a word that God has laid on my heart, then I miss the whole opportunity. Read the 29th chapter closely and it tells you that the priests were given instructions for the tabernacle. Not the sanctuary, but the tabernacle. Not, not the church but the tabernacle. 
The, the instructions are for the priests who will serve at the tabernacle. And when you read the New Testament, you should get irritated when you see the word tabernacle. Because in the New Testament, you see sanctuary, you see church. But in the Old Testament, you see this strange word tabernacle and these knuckleheads nowadays love to call their churches tabernacle baby do you know what a tabernacle is the difference between the tabernacle and the church is that a tabernacle moves you see a church stays still since 1995 here we are this is why i don't understand why y'all can't get to church on time it's been in the same place for the last 30 years this is not a tabernacle. This is a church. Same address, same location. Has the sanctuary has the sanctuary always been in this location? It didn't move from that side of the building to this side of the building. No, since 1995, we's been right here. The pulpit's always been about right here. I think back in the day it was back further a little bit. It's always been about right here. This is a church. We don't move. Stable. Don't matter where you go, we still going to be here. Damon's the pastor, we still here. I'm no longer the pastor, we still going to be here because God is just that good. But in the wilderness, they couldn't set up a church because nobody wanted to live in the wilderness. The goal was to go through the wilderness and to get to Canaan. And so God let them set up temporary places of worship that moved. And that's where every time they set up a temporary place of worship that moved, that was called the tabernacle. It was a, a portable sanctuary. It was a movable place of worship. The, the priest doesn't have to wait until they get to 2295 to be the priest. Because the priest is the priest the minute they walk in to the tabernacle. You missed it. Some of you will have Thanksgiving dinner at your house this year. And some of you will have Thanksgiving dinner at somebody else's house next year. I live in Maryland. My wife's family is from California. We would go to California one, some, one Thanksgiving one year. We'd go to Maryland one year. We'd have it in Atlanta one year. It doesn't matter where we go. Wherever God's people are to break bread, baby, use in the tabernacle. The good thing about God is that God doesn't always wait for you to come to God. God sends his people to find you. The Exodus is about a people who were on the move. And they moved wherever the tabernacle was set up. And the priests could serve God no matter where they were. Let me say it again, the priests, because I'm talking to the priests. The priests could serve God no matter where they were because the tabernacle moved. You, you're not feeling me. Some of you are saying, Reverend Williams, I like the message. And next year when Thanksgiving is back at my house, I'll be the tabernacle. But this year I'm at my in-law's house and I don't like my in-laws, so I'm not going to be the priest this year. This year, I'm having, I'm having Thanksgiving dinner at my son's house. And I love my son, but his wife is just a, a mess. And so at their house, that's not the tabernacle. And I want to get you to understand, you don't get to pick whether or not you are the priest, nor do you get to pick where the tabernacle is. The tabernacle follows wherever the priests go. And since you are the priest, wherever you break bread on Thursday, you're in the tabernacle. And so we give thanks to God for the tabernacle. And just before the bread is broken and just before the beverage is poured, we, we will set up this room in the tabernacle where we will have our Thanksgiving meal. And I submit to you today that no matter where you break bread this Thursday, you will be in the tabernacle because you are the priest. And wherever you are, you create the tabernacle wherever you go. The people will gather. The presence of the living God will be in your house. Thankfulness will rule the day. And God's priest, that's you. God's child, that's you. God's messenger, that's you. You will be in the house. And the Bible says, from the moment you step in the room, I'm in verse 42, you shall offer a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak to you there. 
Each day, brothers and sisters, at the entrance of the burnt, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, a burnt offering was offered before the Lord. They offered a burnt offering at the beginning of the day and the end of the day before they went into the tabernacle, at the entrance of the tabernacle, because they recognized if left up to me, I might go in the tabernacle as me. And every one of us in here, no, let me, can I say it plain? Every one of us in here got somebody in your family that's going to be at the table this Thursday. And if you show up and they show up, it's going to be a problem. Nobody wants to say amen? If you can't say amen, that means you the problem. And what God does not need this Thursday is for you to show up when you are supposed to be representing God as the priest. And so, before we enter the tabernacle, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, I offer God a burnt offering. In other words, before I began my Thanksgiving meal, before I let a single person in my household, before I start talking about food and fellowship, I stop and I make an offering unto the Lord. Lord, everything that's going to happen in this house today belongs to you. Everything that's going to be said to lay belongs to you and if I could somehow take one of my family members and move them one step closer to you God then my living has not been in vain I'm offering an offering to God before the day starts so God can have his way during the day now how do I know I'm right about it some of y'all are so concerned about having a good meal that you will get up at four o'clock in the morning to start basting a turkey. Some of us are so concerned about having a good meal that we will get up at five o'clock in the morning to turn that roast over. Some of us start working on the macaroni and cheese the night before. It's so important to us that the meal is good that before the day starts, we are making preparations to have a wonderful meal. There's some of you in here, you've already planned when you're going to iron your tablecloth. You already know when you're going to do your grocery shopping. Those of you who are laughing, if you don't iron the tablecloth, something's wrong. It's the wrinkles for me. That line is not supposed to be there. It's amazing what a little bit of heat will do. Won't take you long. Just put a little bit of heat or knock that wrinkle right out. And if you fold it properly when the meal is over, then you can just do one straight line and knock that joker right on out. Don't invite me to your house. I have a wrinkle in the tablecloth. If we can put in all that effort before people arrive to our house because we want to make a good impression on our guests, how much more effort should we put in to make sure that we are creating an atmosphere for God to reign? This is why in the 42nd verse, before the day started at the entrance of the tent of meeting, they make an offering to God. It's coming from the tabernacle and the offering, chop this down in your notes, it was about recognition and appreciation. It was about recognizing that the only reason we got out of Egyptian bondage and the only reason we are even able to be here working our way towards the promised land is because God has blessed us. And some of us, when we get together on Thursday and we look at the opulence of the homes we are sitting in and we look at the tastiness of the food that we are eating and we look at the people that are still here around the table and then we think about the ancestors that blessed us to get to the table that we are at, the recognition that God has blessed us and kept us has got to be in the space. I got to begin my Thanksgiving meal recognizing that God has made a way out of no way. And even if this is your first Thanksgiving without somebody, you've had many Thanksgivings leading up to this point and God has been good to you. So I honor God for what has done and then I honor God for the people who are around the table. Here it is. You might get on my nerves. You might worry me half to death. I might be tired of sharing DNA with you. But baby, I'm glad you on the top side of the soil. And since you are here, we gonna thank God. I gotta recognize 
And you show recognition and appreciation by offering the offering before the meal starts. Now here it is, I know what you're thinking. So Reverend Williams, what you're saying is, you want us to take a piece of meat outside and burn it and let the aroma go up to the sky. No. The burnt offering is what they did in Exodus. A prayer will do. Okay? I, I just want you to stop and acknowledge that God has been good to you. I, listen, hear me with this, and I mean this. Don't burn anything on Thursday. Okay? I don't want anything burnt, not a pie crust, not a turkey, not a roll, not nothing. If God has blessed you to have food on your table, don't you dare burn it. And if you burn it, put some butter on it and eat it. The Bible then teaches us that we don't have to begin our Thanksgiving meal with a sacrificial lamb, but we do, the verse is teaching us, have to begin our Thanksgiving meal by being thankful thankful for what God has provided in our lives. And the children of Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage would always stop at the beginning of the tent of meeting. They would see the burnt offering that was sacrificed and they would say thank you. The burnt offering was a way of remembering what they had come through. And in our families, Every single one of our families, we can remember what God has brought us through and we can be thankful as we begin the meal. Now watch this. In the Bible, it wasn't everybody's responsibility to offer two lambs on the altar. Notice in the book, if you read Exodus closely, everybody who came into the tent of meeting was not responsible for making a sacrifice of the lamb. It was the priest job to offer the lamb before the meeting began, the worship began in the tent of meeting. I recognize that everybody who's coming to your Thanksgiving table don't know the Lord. I recognize everybody who's coming to your table doesn't worship God the way that you do. I recognize that everybody who's coming to your Thanksgiving table doesn't care about God the way that you do. And they don't have to. But since you are the priest, if we ever are going to move them from there to here, then we have to do our job by giving thanks at the beginning of the day for what God has done. Now, when you do your job and you've created the atmosphere for goodness to happen at your Thanksgiving table, the Bible says in verse 43, I will meet the Israelites there and that it, 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 the tent of meeting, shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, Aaron and also his sons, and I will consecrate and they will serve me as priests. I want you to notice that if you take the time to pray over your household or the household where you are having your meal before the meeting called Thanksgiving meal shall begin, God says, I'll meet you there. God says, I'll be there. And here it is. Write this down in your notes. God's presence shows up when God is wanted. Let me say it again to make sure you get it in your notes. God's presence shows up where God is wanted. God is omnipresent, which means God is everywhere at the same time. But God is not going to bogart God's way into your Thanksgiving meal if you don't invite God's presence in. Why do you think worship begins with an invocation, which is black people using a real fancy word, which simply means invitation. We are inviting God's presence in at the beginning of the worship experience. Otherwise, God will just sit here and look at us. So you've invited the presence in. And the Bible says in verse 43, that God said, I will meet you there. Watch this. My glory will sanctify the space of your dining room. Here it is. Anybody ever had drama around the holidays? Don't raise your hand. Put your hand down, young man. I'm talking about the holidays. It can get real tense in your household. Sometimes people say this and sometimes people say that. Do you know that if you would be the priest, you can pray that foolishness out of your house? 
It says it right here. My glory will sanctify the space of your dining room. I don't care how ignorant people are in your family. People have trouble being ignorant in the presence of God. They will joyfully be ignorant in your presence. But if you invite the presence of God in the room, literally people will tell you, it feels different in here this year. Something, something is strange in your house this year. Oh, it's because we invited the presence of the Lord in from the beginning. The spirit of God is all in this house. You are going to be blessed today. I'm going to give you good food on the inside and I'm going to give you good food on the inside. My glory will sanctify the space of your dining room, he says. My glory will sanctify the space of your kitchen. My glory will gather all in your home. And of all the preparations you are making in your house, getting ready to invite the presence of our divine God to dwell in your space is what verse 43 requires of the priest. And when you make this commitment, look at what the Bible says, verse 44. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. Your strength to make it through the holiday and allow God to lead will come from God when you acknowledge God as the chapter is telling us. Aaron and his sons did not have it. God said for them to do it, verse 44, I will consecrate them. Choose to set it up God's way, and God will choose you. God will consecrate you, which is a very fancy word, which simply means God will prepare you. The right words to say at the right time that are going to bind your family together and give God the glory will literally be written in your tongue to be articulated to other people because God will prepare you. Just like the priests within the children of Israel had to deal with disgruntled members of the community, so too sometimes you and I have to deal with disgruntled members of our family when it comes around the holidays, and God will consecrate you as the priest if you will honor the instructions in the chapter. Finally, verse 45 says, I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God, and they shall know I am the Lord their God. Stop right there. You've been waiting your whole life for people in your family to get it, to figure out how good God is. And you've been trying to tell them. You've been trying to work it into their brains. The Bible does not say you have to tell them. The Bible does not say that you have to make them understand. The Bible does not say that you have to teach them. The Bible says you have to be the priest and prepare the space. And then allow yourself to be consecrated. And if you would focus on your relationship with God and God's expectations of you, the book says, I'm not making this up, the book says, they shall know. Which means you don't have to do anything. God will do everything. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and that I will dwell among them, and I am their God. They will know because God will minister to them. It is the Lord who will dwell at your dining room table. It is the Lord who will choose your family and allow them to understand that God is their God. And here it is. They will know that I am the Lord, their God. The one thing you've been waiting for, you've been dragging them to church, you drug them to Sunday school, you've been preaching to them, you've been ministering to them, you've been texting them all kinds of gospel songs, you've been doing all kinds of stuff. I just want you to put a pause on all that activity. This Thursday, all I want you to do is do what the Bible tells you to do. I want you to prepare your home because you understand that you are the priest. Then I want you to ask God, God, consecrate me that whatever comes in this house this day, I might be a blessing to whoever walks in this house. Consecrate me that that I might teach your word as you've been called to teach consecrate me that I might love my family as I have been called to love consecrate me that I might have grace when they do this year what they do every year consecrate me that I might forgive them if they take me to my past consecrate me that I can be your child if you do that the Bible says they shall know that I am the Lord their God. And here it is. If you read the Bible closely, you'll notice they offered a burnt offering at the beginning of the day 
and they offered a burnt offering at the end of the day. The offering at the beginning of the day was a God, please do this. The offering at the end of the day was God, thank you for what you've done. And when your family and your friends leave your house this Thursday, you don't have to burn any more food. I just want you to stand in your house, close your eyes, and tell God, thank you for all that you've done. Do that, and this Thanksgiving you will have tabernacle. Lord, prepare me to be a 